An inquiry has been launched into the causes of the shooting last year that so shocked the close-knit community. Parents of, of the victims Parenting are campaigning calls for gun laws, killing 12 students and a Kevin Kachadorian. important we understand this phenomena. March 6th, 2001. Dear Franklin, Today I will write about April 8th, 1999. Thursday. I got up at the usual time, 6.30 a.m. I roused Celia and helped her clean and replace her prosthetic eye. It is amazing what you can get used to. I'm making toast when Kevin walks into the kitchen. Hey, Kev, look at you! He's wearing the same fencing shirt and black trousers he wore on our disastrous dinner date. Some days you just wake up with a sense of occasion. I watch him stow five kryptonite locks into his backpack. I think nothing of it. He'd been trading bike parts at school that semester. Yeah. Now, I got the new camera. I'd like to shoot a roll of you at archery practice. I sift sugar over Celia's French toast. As I kiss her on the head, Kevin cuts me a glance. Slapping his shoulder is a mistake. Kevin flinches, grimaces. To allow such a slip, he must have had other things on his mind, but he recovers fast. Yeah, that. That'd be great. No. That morning, you kiss me on the cheek. The unexpected warmth makes me see my family in soft focus. Celia in a halo of sunlight. You having a father-son chat about shutter speeds and arrows. I should be able to pick up you and the arrow in flight. And get you in the picture of course. Shut up! That's enough! Shut up! I don't care about your camera. I don't want to do what you do. It's shit! I'm not interested in baseball or Civil War museums. And all the phony happy days crap. My life is none of your business. So back off. You look stunned. I meet your eyes and shake my head, cancelling restraint. Okay, Kevin. Point taken. As abruptly as he had exploded, Kevin folds right back up. We gradually resume the pretense of normality. I hug Celia goodbye. But as I put her down, she stands wide-eyed and stricken. I miss you. I'll miss you too, I say. Your own kiss isn't the standard peck, but feverish, deep. I wish I had held that moment, Franklin. But aware of Kevin's hostile gaze, I make myself pull away. You all right, Kevin? Never better. I touch his shoulder in farewell, and I head for the door. Hey, sure you don't want to say goodbye to Celia one more time? Very funny. And I leave. A normal working day is resumed. Until, at 6.15 p.m., I turn on the car radio. The details are incomplete. A scene of carnage in the school gym. Unknown casualties. I call your cell, cursing that you're call screening. I phone home. Kevin doesn't pick up. He rarely does. But I turn the car around and head to the school. Grinding through traffic, I have plenty of time to think. And let me get one thing straight. I have often believed the worst of Kevin. That he used diapers until he was six out of spite. That he goaded Violetta into flaying herself. That he sabotaged Trent's bike. That he had some part in Celia losing her eye. That he tormented anorexic Laura Wolford and planted a hit list in Miguel Espinosa's locker. That he abused Vicky Pogorski, not the other way around. Granted, until I saw Marlon's documentary, I also thought Kevin had destroyed my favorite photograph. But even my maternal cynicism has its limits. When I heard there had been a shooting at Kevin's school, I feared for his well-being. I never imagined he was the perpetrator. Eva. March 11th, 2001. Dear Franklin, I want to tell you about Thursday. Exactly what happened, as I understand it. 
But first, I need to tell you about Kevin's interview with Marlon. Rental negligence? Totally bogus. More culture of compensation. But whether yes, or not I watched the rest of the tape today. Remiss. Oh, lay off my mother. She's been all over the world. You know that? Set up her own Over the last two years, he's acquired a maze store. of little battle scars. His okay, nose is no longer straight. He looks so not I, tough, but so we're even. The rest is private. hurt. Okay, next question. I guess there's only one question left, Kevin. The question all our viewers would want to ask. Why'd you do it? Kevin had been waiting for this. Okay. It's like this. You wake up and watch TV. You drive to work and listen to the radio. You get on with your little life. But you're not going to hear about that on the 6 o'clock news because, guess what? Nothing's really happening. You come home and read the paper, or more likely, watch TV again. And what is it you're watching, listening to, reading about every day? People like me. He sits back and folds his arms. People don't just watch killers, Kevin. <laughs> Bullshit. If all I'd done was get an A in geometry, they'd have changed the channel by now, right? What'd you do without kids like me, huh, Jack? Make a documentary about people who watch TV. So you're proud of what you've done? Kevin raises one sardonic eyebrow. No remorse. No regrets. Sure. I have regrets. He pauses again. Seems Vicky Pogorski had taught him well. Should have put one right between the eyes of that Legronsky dork when I had the chance. He's been dining out on his terrible ordeal ever since. Like he's some sort of expert. It's not his story. It's mine. He looks into the camera, those eyes boring right through the lens into the living room. All you people out there, you're listening to what I say because I've got something you ain't. Something you want. I got plot. I know what my life is about because I'm not watching it. I'm making it. Okay, it was kind of gory. But admit it, you loved it. You lapped it up. I turned off the video. And I wiped the tape. Eva. March 17th, 2001. Dear Franklin, Anyone can download numerous versions of Kevin's itinerary that Thursday. This is what I've pieced together. We'll start with the invitations. During the last week of February, Kevin appropriates some Gladstone High stationery. He writes a convincingly pompous letter to nine students, informing them they have been singled out for a bright and shining promise award. He invites them to a secret meeting at the school gym on Thursday, April 8th at 3.30 p.m. He fakes the principal's signature. Sincerely. He composes a similar letter to Dana Rocco regarding a Most Beloved Teacher Award. On April 8th, nothing seems out of the ordinary. At 7.45 a.m., Kevin catches the school bus, carrying his archery equipment and five bike locks. He attends all his classes. In English, he asks Dana Rocco to define the word maleficence. He spends the final period alone in the gym for private study archery practice. He has ample time to clear the space and arrange six blue mats in a convivial circle. At three o'clock, the bell rings. Kevin locks all but one of the gym doors with the bike chains and installs himself in a second-floor alcove. He waits. At 3.20... The first of the bright and shining arrive. Mouse, Greer, and Laura. They sit on the workout mats. Soweto arrives, followed by Jeff and Denny. Ziggy dances into the room. Miguel shuffles with his nose in a book. At 3.25, Dana Rocco arrives. At 3.28, a cafeteria worker enters with a tray of sandwiches, a nice touch, but he then starts chatting to Soweto. This is not the plan. Kevin has a gate crasher. And one of his guests is missing. 
At 3.35, Joshua finally makes his entrance. Kevin chains the door behind him. Voila! Fish in a barrel. He returns to the alcove and watches from above. Five long minutes pass before he takes up the crossbow. At 3.40, a soft rushing sound terminates in Laura Wolford's chest. Like the pause between lightning and thunder, there is a silence between the arrow strike and the first screams. Struggling to his feet, Miguel takes one in the gut. Jeff is nailed between the shoulder blades as he bends over Laura, who is dead. Dana yells as it begins to rain arrows. As Joshua rattles the main doors, a shaft sinks into his neck. Mouse, trying the boys' locker room, takes an arrow in the ass. Carrying Laura, Dana Roca reaches the girls' exit. All the doors are locked, and every square foot of the gym can be penetrated from the alcove. Cries Dana. Maleficence. Hisses Kevin. With the same deadpan concentration he shows on the archery range, he puts an arrow right between her eyes. While Kevin is busy reaming Soweto Washington's thighs, Joshua Lukronsky assembles a shield from exercise mats and the two corpses. From here, he observes unfolding events. Incensed, Greer Ulanov marches into the center of the room. and screams that she hopes he gets the chair. Only a month before, she'd written an impassioned essay against capital punishment. Kevin shoots her through the foot, pinning her to the floor. Ziggy stands before Kevin. Listen. You don't have to do this. Some of these guys will be okay if we get the medics right now. Please. In reply, Kevin dispatches the cafeteria worker. Ziggy is now the only person standing. But he continues to talk. Even tries to empathize with Kevin's pain. Empathy is his downfall. By 3.50, nine students, one teacher and one cafeteria worker were on the floor. The whole melee lasted less than 10 minutes. Franklin, I hope this dispassionate narration doesn't seem callous. It's just that the facts remain bigger and bolder than any one small grief. Except my own. Eva. Eva.